I'm Don Durham and welcome to Patent Pod. A multi-tiered system of support for mathematics requires many stakeholders to ensure the systems level and the individual student level is aligned, supportive, and effective. In a recent edition of the Communique, Dr. Erica Caruder and Jared Campbell, two patent educational consultants, provided insight into practical strategies for supporting a multi-tiered system of support for mathematics. Patent Pod is very excited to welcome both Erica and Jared today to help us think through how to best support mathematics instruction. Erica and Jared, thank you so much for being on Patent Pod. We're excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for having us. We are excited to be here. Jared, I'm going to start with you, if I if I may. We're thinking about you know kind of taking this information from the article that you and Erica have, and you know you talk about ensuring that we have a common understanding about what signifies effective instruction in mathematics. And I'm actually going to go effective instruction in any area, really. So, what are those pillars of effective, high quality core instruction? That's a great question. So, high quality core instruction is defined in two parts. The first being standards aligned, and the second is the use of evidence-based practices. Essentially, we need to focus on the right content and use good instruction in the classroom. Some of these practices that have been proven effective in the research include teaching new content using principles of explicit instruction, improving retention and recall by linking new information to prior knowledge, increasing students' metacognition, or teaching students how to monitor their own learning and take actionable steps to improve over time. We can increase motivation by helping students establish and monitor their growth towards learning goals. We need to explicitly teach a problem solving process and identify underlying schema and word problems. We want to make sure that practice opportunities are carefully designed and they're matched to student skill level, blocked for acquisition, and we want to interleave problems, including worked examples and space those over time for retrieval practice. We also want to consider students' mastery of prerequisite skills to determine whether or not they're ready to learn more advanced content or if we might need to intervene. Each of these practices has evidence-based strategies used to bring them to life in the classroom, but these seven are a good starting point for teachers. So Jared, what you're really talking about is making sure that we have the right content in conjunction with good, solid instruction. That's kind of what I hear you saying. And, and you talked about many different aspects there. We're talking about explicit instruction. We're talking about students and teaching students to monitor their understanding and where they're going. Motivation, ensuring that we have aligned and appropriately used practice opportunities where the students are responding multiple times with that. Prerequisite skills, knowing whether or not we should be moving forward. You talked about schema and being being able to understand the underlying thoughts around a problem solving process. I mean, there were just so many pieces and parts there, but I think it really comes down to, you had said, standards aligned and evidence-based practices. Am I capturing that correct, that those are the two key pillars when we think about effective, high quality instruction? It's a perfect way to summarize it. Awesome. So Eric, let me ask you this then. So Jared's kind of laid a foundation for understanding what effective, high quality instruction looks like, particularly in mathematics. So in the article, you both had shared recommendations for assisting students who are struggling in mathematics. Can you help us out with what those recommendations are? And Eric, I'm going to give you two tasks here. What are those recommendations? And then how can school psychologists assist in those recommendations? Absolutely. So that's a great question, Dawn. Uh, we looked at recommendations from the Institute on Education Sciences, and there's a very helpful practice guide on assisting students who struggle with mathematics. And it summarizes from the research practices with really great effect sizes and strong evidence to support their efficacy. This is a really great resource for school psychologists to familiarize themselves with. So first we think about systematic instruction or in other words, teaching that is a really carefully planned sequence, including building from easier to more difficult tasks, as well as breaking down harder skills into smaller parts. We want to do this during intervention to help students develop understanding of mathematical ideas. Next, it's important to teach clear, concise, and accurate mathematical language. Uh, terminology, vocabulary, and language structures must be taught, practiced, and reinforced so students can communicate their mathematical thinking, as well as better access content during core instruction. Teaching mathematical language can be integrated during intervention time. So when we think about it, math is really an academic language that needs taught, practiced, and reinforced just like any other language. 
Uh, a third recommendation is the use of concrete and semi-concrete representations to help students develop learning of mathematical concepts and procedures. So representations can be things such as manipulatives like base 10 blocks, fraction tiles, or other physical materials that students can use to connect the value of numbers and relationships to quantities and make mathematics visible. Ultimately, we want to help students connect those concrete representations mm -hmm. to the abstract representations or that mathematical notation. Uh, next, number lines are really powerful tools that can help connect to a variety of representation, including all real numbers, whole numbers, and rational numbers, um, fractionals and fractions and decimals, as well as positive and negative numbers, uh, while also helping students make that connection to magnitude. We can think of many examples of number lines in real life, thermometers, for example. But number lines can really help students better understand math concepts and procedures, help them facilitate connections to grade level material, and help prepare students for advanced math. So that consistent use of number lines can really help students build an understanding of the number system. Uh, fifth recommendation in there is providing deliberate instruction on solving word problems. Having good computation skills alone won't help students solve word problems. It's really important to teach students to identify word problem types. You may have also heard of these being called schemas, things such as change or difference schemas uh, that include the same type of action or event and teach them a solution method for solving each problem type. And finally, timed activities have very strong evidence as well to support students experiencing difficulty with mathematics. We want to help students develop quick retrieval with basic math facts so that it frees up working memory to engage in more complex problem solving. It's really important to recognize that timed activities are very brief, one to five minutes maximum daily, and they're only a part of comprehensive math intervention. It's also important to recognize that we don't want to use timed activities when students are first learning or acquiring a computation skill. We want to introduce timed activities for computation skills when students have some level of accuracy, but they might be slow in responding. This is when we know that they're ready to start building fluency with that skill. So uh, another element, having students chart their own progress mm -hmm. adds a level of motivation to timed activities. School psychologists are very knowledgeable in resources to help support teachers with timed activities and self-charting, for example. And so the second part of your question, Don, how can school psychologists assist with these recommendations from the IES practice guide? Uh, first, familiarizing yourself with uh, the, the recommendations in there. But in our work, Jared and I often hear from school psychologists when we're doing training sessions or consultation that they have a lot more confidence in their skills to support literacy or behavior than they do for mathematics. This isn't surprising given the amount of focus and research on literacy and behavior interventions historically. However, there is a growing body of research showing us what works in math as well. So school psychologists can start by working on improving their own understanding of effective math assessment, instructional and intervention practices. Uh, taking that practice guide and developing a PLC around it at their school, for example, might be one way. Um, they can seek out sessions focused on the science of math and math intervention. It's really great to have job alike professional development sessions with other school psychologists to talk about job specific aspects of math intervention. But it's equally important to partner with math educators, interventionists, administrators to establish common understanding and collaborative efforts. When we partner together in professional learning, that can be a really great way to do this. You know, Erica, you had said so many things here. I don't want to repeat all those recommendations, but there are a few that I do want to highlight. First of all, I appreciate that you bringing it right back to those practice guides. These are not ideas someone has, but these are based and grounded in those effect sizes, knowing what is impactful in the instructional setting. Um, and just a few of those recommendations, systematic instruction, sequence from easier to more complex skills, clear and concise language, um, number lines, you had talked about moving from that concrete representation into when available into that abstract representation. I really appreciate that you talked about timed activities. You know, I think that's one of these great myths 
in education, particularly around mathematics, is that timed activities are bad or harmful, when in fact, what you're saying is the evidence says they are valuable to the instruction when you know when and how to use them effectively. So I appreciate you kind of dipping our toes back into timed activities. You talked, going back to those schema, which as Jared had brought back as one of the, one of the key points or pillars to effective instruction is teaching the schema around um, our problems and our word problems. So I really think that those recommendations are critical to kind of reflect on and think about. And your point to school psychologists need to be familiar with these recommendations and then really kind of do a little self-reflection around where may I need some more understanding? Where do I need to dig a little bit deeper? Am I, am I understanding that right? That we have to kind of engage in that self-reflection to determine where I may need to go for my own professional learning advancement, yeah? Absolutely, and partnering with our colleagues to develop that common understanding um, and, and collaborative efforts all together to improve math intervention. Wonderful. Now, Erica, I'm going to stick with you, but Jared, I'll ask you to kind of chime in in a moment here. When we think about beyond effective practices, particularly for assessment, where can schools psychologists really have a, a play and a role, and how do they collaborate with math educators beyond just, well, let me give this assessment and tell you what's needed? Where's that collaboration? How does that look? Yeah, absolutely. So as I just shared, one of the great ways is to partner through professional learning efforts together. Uh, school psychologists can also assist with things like class-wide intervention implementation efforts through coaching, fidelity checks, data analysis, helping teachers and teams with instructional matching. Uh, those are just a few ways school psychologists can collaborate. But I think I'll turn it over to Jared, who has experience as a high school math teacher, to share his thoughts on how school psychologists can be helpful as well. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, school life gets crazy, right? And, and teachers are always busy. And it's really easy to become overwhelmed by the day-to-day -day tasks of running your classroom. And in that type of situation, it gets even harder to consider professional growth, let alone try to find time to actually do your own research. School psychologists are well positioned to review evidence and provide those types of summaries to teachers. And it's even more valuable when you consider that school psychologists are probably pulling from different fields of study than what a gen ed teacher is likely to, to go out and look up. You know, I think, too, we often miss that school psychologists really can support coaching and implementation efforts. And from a teacher perspective, it's it can be easy to only implement some of an effective practice or to apply a good practice at the wrong time. And this reduces or potentially nullifies the impact of that instructional strategy. School psychologists, therefore, can help us as teachers avoid that overgeneralization overgeneralization or partial implementation. And one of the ways they can specifically support is through the use of checklists that both they and teachers can use to reflect on implementation. School psychologists have a lot to offer teachers and teachers need to consider them a partner and an instructional coach. You know, Jared, um, and, and Erica, to your point as well, when we think about the role school psychologists play, it's so much larger and expand so much more than perhaps we used to think. And I heard the both of you talking about class-wide intervention. Jared, you, you mentioned and, and kind of hit upon coaching and implementation efforts. You talked about data conversations, reviewing evidence. These are, are pieces and parts to the role a school psychologist can play to support what's happening in an MTSS framework, particularly for mathematics. So I think it's really key that we kind of continue to come back to that with that understanding that it is a collaboration and it is a joint partnership effort. Um, you know, but I have to, I'm going to be very candid and honest here. Obviously, that's the ideal situation to have school psychologists partner with our practitioners to deliver instruction, have these conversations, really look at systems level work. But that may not always be plausible to kind of attack all at one time. So Erica, can you speak to a little bit about what would be a practical solution, like kind of a next step or the next two steps for school psychologists to really deploy rather than seeing this large task and getting overwhelmed, what are two baby steps we can take to start to make this process happen? Yeah, thank you for that question, Dawn. We do recognize that many school psychologists carry heavy testing caseloads. Maybe they work in high ratios or they might not just be sure where to start. Uh, I was recently reminded of an idea that really helps guide the work of school psychologists. And that is the idea that we should be generally useful. 
So there are really multiple entry points where school psychologists can find a way to support improving math in their school. Uh, with our training in assessment and data analysis, things like assisting with universal math screening efforts, for example, or offering to analyze and compile the screening data for problem solving at data meetings might be a great first step to take. We're recording in winter schools should have recently done their winter screening, but right after a screening might be a great time to take that first step. Mm -hmm. um, they could offer to, even if they're not participating in those data meetings, they could offer to be generally useful and take notes at data meetings and contribute to that problem solving process. Um, this can help them start to make the shift of their efforts to focus on prevention as well as for the teams working on establishing a multi-tiered system of supports for math to see school psychologists as generally useful. So finding that entry point and solving problems at the systems level will provide the greatest benefit because it is very resource intensive to provide individual interventions, especially when too many students are recommended for an individual intervention. That can translate into the school psychologist testing caseload. Um, so that might be an entry point at systems level. Uh, helping to connect assessment to intervention to ensure effective skill by treatment interaction. So in other words, that is ensuring instruction and intervention efforts are explicitly aligned to student performance and the root cause for performance gaps is a key component of systems change that's applicable for school sites working at problem solving at the systems group or individual level. Um, if, if it is difficult to get started at that systems level, perhaps another entry point might be collaborating with one math teacher uh, around classroom level data to determine if class-wide intervention is needed and then provide those supports around fidelity implementation. Or perhaps it may be uh, working with one classroom teacher to provide consultation around intervention implementation efforts to support one student who is experiencing difficulty and maybe needs some strategic or intensive math intervention. Uh, helping to facilitate problem solving meetings to connect assessment to intervention for a small group of students or one student experiencing difficulty. But that experience in supporting advanced tiers of mathematics intervention will be valuable as school psychologists look towards scaling up their systems level work. So wherever school psychologists might be in their journey of supporting an MTSS for math, we encourage them to take that next step, that next baby step towards supporting systems, or maybe that very first step uh, to improve outcomes for every student. You know, Erica, you had talked about we ultimately our goal is systems level, right? We know it's to really attack and, and address the systems level work, but we may need to take a first step in looking at that classroom level and starting small. And you had said, you know, if that systems level is not reachable, where can we make an impact? And you had, you had mentioned this numerous times. I want to hold on to this phrase, generally useful generally useful where can we be present where can we offer some insight or a different perspective or lens of which to look at the problem solving process and i think that's something to hold on to is school psychologists can be generally useful when they're present and a part of that mtss structure and framework so thank you for making sure that we kind of ended on that note i appreciate that you know, Jared and Erica, this was a conversation we needed to have. We understand that it's a different environment in our school settings right now, and resource allocation is critical when we think about the environment that all of our practitioners, our students, and our larger communities are under. So uh, both of you, I so appreciate you being on Pat and Pod. Thank you so much for making sure that we engaged in this very critical conversation right now. Thank you for having us, Dawn. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you to all of you in the field. You are truly an inspiration to us all. A special thank you to John Ragsdale for producing this podcast. We'll see you next time on Pat and Pod.